Yeah, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to um, present this. This is a uh, yeah, for sort of ongoing work and I'm very keen to see what discussions lead from it and how we can help contribute. So this is a, a bit of GA's perspective on matters about quality and um, starts with a bit of a story that in a, uh, sometime in 2020, um, there was a, a geologist um, at a, a junior mineral exploration company needing to make some, uh, some very important decisions. Um, we'll call them Joe for the sake of the, the conversation. Um, so her, her company was interested in applying for a license to explore for mineral resources in an area uh, near Tenna Creek, uh, which is in the basically bang in the middle of the Northern Territory, um, looking say for resources like uh, copper, uh, which are a sort of very important part of a um, sort of an electrified low carbon future. Um, so some data that Geoscience Australia had acquired in the region had just been released um, and she would, would have been very conscious that there are other companies interested in this. Um, so, you know, time was critical to, um, for her to company to make a, um, to put in an application for what's called an exploration license uh, to go and explore in an area. Uh, so, you know, a lot of, lot of kind of tension, a lot of things riding on that. Um, and what it comes down to is basically a question of trust. Could she trust the data that Geoscience Australia had provided? Could she rely on that data in her decision making? Um, and if she needed to sort of poke and prod a bit to test the quality of the data, did she have the information um, on hand to do so? So uh, I'll walk you through some of some of the background to that story. Uh, so my name is Keith Sirkham. I'm the uh, laboratory director here at Geoscience Australia uh, in uh, slightly soggy Canberra here today. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll take you for a journey of the quality of some of the conversations that we've been having around uh, leading uh, quality and as, more importantly, perhaps is actually building the culture around having that conversation and about getting people engaged and, and recognizing it's, you know, it's an important part of the, of the work we do. And again, I'm very keen to hear your, your perspectives uh, on that uh, as well. Uh, I'll quickly run through what the laboratory um, actually does and uh, so you've got some context of what we do as well as a quick taste of some of the, the things that we're working on now and some of the directions we're, we're, we're trying to go in. Uh, so quickly just sort of running through the core capabilities of, of the laboratory. Uh, so we have sort of four core capabilities across the laboratory and I'll, I'll run you through some of these, but I'll, I'll, I'll really emphasize that this is just a very quick highlights reel. Uh, there's many capabilities I'm skipping over in the interest of time. I'm sort of ha happy to, to talk about it more um, after the presentation, but I just sort of wanted to give you a quick flavor of, of the variety and complexity of the data sets uh, we need to work with when we're sort of defining and, and capturing, you know, what is quality. So we'll start with sample preparation because this, this is sort of right at the, the start of the guts of things. Because um, basically, you know, we, we handle thousands of samples a year from all over Australia. Um, so, you know, these things come in. If we get it wrong here, then everything else is rubbish afterwards. So no matter how wonderful our anal analysis is, no matter how precise our instruments are, uh, if we're analyzing the wrong sample or we're taking the wrong bit of the sample, then the results are rubbish. Um, so our team spent a lot of time here, you know, checking samples against lists of field numbers and relabeling things and checking them again and subsampling and checking again. Um, so that's quite an important part of that quality journey. Um, this area also specializes in grain size analysis. Um, so essentially taking a sample of loose sediment like this, say from the seafloor, and uh, to measure how much is mud, how much is sand, how much is gravel. And, uh, you know, that's an important data set because it gives you some uh, clues as to what sort of ecosystems might be living in that area of the seafloor. So you can, you know, once you've got enough samples, you can start building up maps like this across the um, the northern part of Australia that tells you something about what uh, sort of uh, 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 ecological uh, systems may be living up there. Um, and we do that traditionally with, with uh, sieves and also with more modern equipment as well that measure the, the scatter of the light as the sample falls through the, the water column. So uh, another area is organic and isotope um, because uh, so the, you know, the grain size might give you some clues about what's living there today, but uh, uh, the earth history, particularly of life, you know, well over a billion years uh, of life and, and particularly leaving behind uh, 
these things, uh, which are basically what we call fossil biomarkers. So when you know plants or animals uh, die, they leave behind chemical fossils, basically, um, which provide a fascinating insight into uh, the history of of those environments as well, and how you know how those hydrocarbons in the region formed and uh, and how they're related to each other. Uh, so we, we've got instruments like this, the classic gas um, chromatography and just in instrument. Uh, and we can build up from the sort of data these instruments collect, we can start building up uh, quite sort of these, these sort of diagrams that sort of relate uh, how different samples, in this case, uh, uh, from different wells across the, what's the Browse Basin on the Northwest Shelf of Australia, how these are related to each other. And again, you could sort of see that, you know, this data, uh, as well as, you know, just being interesting science, because it's, it's amazing to think, well, you know, we can go back and figure out what sort of environment was there hundreds of millions of years ago. But it also has important implications for, again, uh, how resources might get developed um, and what uh, industry does with that data. Uh, the fourth area is uh, uh, basically geochronology. Microanalysis of mineral separation is working out how old a rock is, because yes, the Earth, is, the Earth has been going for four and a half billion years. A uh, lot of lot of rocks in that time uh, that need to be dated. Um, and then once we know the date, we can work out where they sit in relation to each other and what's happened to them. It's a fundamental data set that Geoscience Australia collects. Um, we do that by getting little grains of like this called zircon out of a rock uh, which contain trace amounts of uranium that decays to lead and we can do the math and work out how old they are um, using very big instruments like this it's called a it's uh, tongue-in-cheek it's called a shrimp but it's actually you're looking at about 12 tons of stainless steel sitting there so it's anything but shrimp like um, but it does analyze very small grains so this is one of these sand grains you can see the little spot that the shrimp's actually analyzing for that uranium and lead. To give you a sort of context, there's a human hair uh, on average for scale. So again, producing a, a, another distinct data set um, with sort of isotopic ratios and ages. Uh, and again, you know, very complex calculations that again, all need to be kept track of and understood and, um, through a data quality process. So why do we do it all? Um, so, I mean, I started with that example of Joe uh, from a junior exploration company, but Joe could just as easily be an agronomist wanting, you know, soil chemistry information um, to support pastoral or coppering production. She could be a government regulator wanting, you know, reliable baseline information to monitor potential environmental changes. Uh, or she could be a, a community leader in a remote community uh, wanting to understand more about uh, her community's options for a new water supply. And this pathway, which is developed as part of the uh, Exploring for the Future program at Geoscience Australia, sort of helps map out how our data that we collect um, is used um, by people like Joe to come up with uh, benefits and impacts um, right across Australia. So we can we sort of zoom in on that, you know, we produce the data sets. So all of that systems thinking, all of that data we acquire, all of the talent of, of people and the instruments we have all come together to produce a set of data that someone like Joe can use. Uh, in the exploration case, you know, she will make a, a pick about where they go exploring. If they get lucky, they might find a, something that's prospective, get a bit more investment, keep exploring. If they get really, really lucky, they might find, hey, we found a, a new copper deposit, um, you know, and gather more investment and um, if, if they get to the point of actually mining, uh, you know, in some of those situations, it, it brings uh, investment into that region that otherwise might not happen around, um, you know, like rail lines and roads and power and things like that. Um, but importantly as well, for, again, for a low carbon future, some of these minerals that they're looking for, like copper and rare earths, are going to be quite vital um, for that uh, uh, low carbon future. So the critical point in that pathway and why I bring it up and why what its link is to quality and the discussion that we're having about quality is that that leap there between outputs and outcomes. We produce the outcomes. Uh, sorry, we produce the outputs. The report, I get that right. Um, but we can't make people use that data. We can't make them make decisions using that data. And trust is the sort of the key part of that leap from taking our taking our products and then using them and then using them well to make good decisions. 
So it sort of that gives us, gives you the idea of why we're talking about quality and the, increasingly the conversations that we're having about quality at Geoscience Australia Laboratory uh, with our clients and, and collaborators. So this is work in progress. This is an attempt to develop a framework that our collaborators can engage with to understand why we take it so seriously, why we think it's important to them and to the broader community. And I'll quickly run through some of the, the things that we, we talk about, um, uh, some of the concepts that we're trying to uh, bring to people's attention, um, as well as a sort of a quick example of what that looks like. The first is around quality uncertainty. Um, so this builds on the work of uh, Simone Vizier, uh, who's the Professor of Psychology, Ethics and Wellbeing at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and uh, her ideas in turn build on the Nobel Economics Prize winning ideas of George Akerlof about how quality uncertainty impacts the market. So the concept is, is you have a buyer and a seller. And in our case, okay, Geoscience Australia is providing the data for free, but the, the person who uses it still has to invest their resources in it. So, you know, in a sense, it may be free to acquire, but it's not free for them to use and to process. Um, so there's still a cost that they need to bear. So they need to know that they, they're getting it right. So in the, in the concept of that market idea is that, yes, there's a buyer and seller, but the, the seller has more information about the product quality than the buyer, because obviously they put it together. Um, in, the, in the George Akerlof model, this, he used, used cars as an example, is that the person selling the used car is going to have more information about the history of that car. You know, if it's been in an accident or if it's had major work done or, you know, something like that. Um, so the user or the buyer is going to be uncertain and they may be hesitant. And if, you know, uh, if for experience or bad luck, they may come to distrust the whole market. Um, so what then happens is the supplier is sort of forced to sell at a lower cost, um, put cut a few corners to, to save, save on expenses and things like that. And that eventually reduces the overall quality and you sort of get into this, potentially into this vicious loop where um, people, the user becomes more and more distrustful. The way out of that is to improve the transparency of the quality information. So try to offset as much as you can that imbalance between the seller and the buyer, or in this case, the provider of the data and the user of the data. So that's sort of takeaway number one is transparency of quality information is critical for good science. The second concept I like talking to people about is, is uh, expanding their horizons when it comes to what does quality mean. Um, most scientists will focus immediately on the product. Um, and I've done, I've done little sort of informal surveys that sort of show that if you ask them, well, what makes a high quality, you know, geochemistry data set, they'll sort of start waxing lyrical about, you know, particular elements and, you know, of, of that data set, you know, particular uh, qualities or elements and things like that. Um, whereas I, I quite like this model from um, Kenyon and Sen, where they sort of talk about qualities actually a bit, a lot more than that. It's about uh, how, you know, from a user perspective, how the data was, in this our case, how the data was delivered, how that product was delivered. Um, but then also internally about, you know, what does the organization do to support quality? What are the processes and how are you capturing that information about the processes that produce the product? And importantly, as well as like, well, what was supplying? What, what supply lines did you have into that process? And in some cases, if you're outsourcing, for example, you know, how are you controlling the quality around that outsourcing? So takeaway number two, I try to get across to people is that product quality, you know, isn't just about the product itself or just about the data set or, you know, the uncertainty and measurements of the data set is actually a, a from a user perspective is, is a lot more um, to it. So concept three is about fit for purpose quality. And we're, you'd be all familiar with this triangle um, where, you know, you can have uh, any two of those options. So you can produce, you can have a, a product or a service that's good and fast, but it won't be cheap, for example. Um, you know, and this is often used. And you would often think, well, perhaps, you know, being a high quality upstanding government facility, good is not always an option. So it always has to be between cheap and fast. But as I'm sure many of you know, um, when, when the pressure's on, good can sometimes become a little bit optional, um, and there's always the pressure to find cheap and fast uh, options as well. So I, I try to have a conversation when we're in those sort of situations to talk um, 
uh, about this this particular model, which again, I'm sure some of you are familiar with about what's called the prevention appraisal and failure cost model, which describes how you find optimal quality. So uh, if you're analyzing something in our case, uh, the level of quality will go up, but it'll cost more, you know, it'll be a more expensive instrument, it'll be a longer process, it'll be a more detailed process. So it'll go, it'll become more expensive. Whereas the cost of failure, so if we collect the data and that there's something wrong with it, that we need to go back and reanalyze it, or someone makes a decision based on that data and it's wrong, you know, the cost of failure will, will be um, higher for the a lower level of quality. So the idea is that somewhere in the middle, there will be a sweet spot, which is the optimal quality, which is right here and now. Um, what I like to talk about is, well, that's actually going to change over time. What's optimal now may not be optimal 5, 10, 20 years from now. And presumably there's some lower limit at which point, you know, the user no longer wants that data. It's no longer a use to them. And we can actually show this. This is a you know, real example and a good example of, you know, how capturing quality information, the, the sort of metadata behind some of those results is really important. So this is going back to that shrimp instrument I showed you. Uh, Geoscience Australia has been operating these instruments since basically 1990. And we've collected all of this data. We have quite comprehensive data sets. And in this particular case, it's measuring a thing called the uncertainty one sigma. So this would be one of these things scientists get excited about and understanding quality. Um, it's basically a measure of how well the machine's measuring the same thing. So uh, we give it a homogeneous standard and how well it's measuring it again and again. And you can see from this data set that yes, our quality has improved over time. You know, there's been a steady uh, on average decline uh, in, in that uncertainty, which is fantastic. And in fact, the last few years, uh, a lot of those numbers are actually been arbitrarily set is that the, the analysts couldn't quite believe that it was that good. So they've just left it at 1%, for example, whereas actually the data was much better. Um, so yeah, quality does improve over time and we have to account for that. So what the concept is, is that, well, we try and have the conversation is like, well, how about pushing, you know, rather than sort of saying, I need it now and I need it fast and I need it cheap is like, well, let's consider what, what you want this data to, what longevity you want the data to have. Do you still want this data to be good in 20 years time? And, uh, you know, extend that window uh, of that data lifetime. And it's also important to point out that isn't just necessarily meaning, oh, we need a more expensive instrument or we need a more detailed process, is that you can improve the quality of that data set by doing things like capturing some of that metadata that I just showed you from the shrimp, for example, um, you know, by investing in capturing that. So that data lives with the, with the actual analytical data as well. Uh, and, you know, and from a user point of view is about the delivery of that data is also a function of quality as well. So, you know, the, the quality cost is, is a bit more nuanced. So the takeaway there is consider quality now and in the future. Uh, one thing we do, because we do one, we actually now outsource some of our uh, inorganic uh, analyses, uh, is that we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we manage quality control when it's outsourced. So this is part of that supply uh, aspect of quality as well. Um, so one of the things you do in uh, inorganic um, uh, geochemistry, where you take rock samples and you want to know their whole rock geochemistry, uh, is you take splits of samples at various points. So you split things in the field, you take samples from either side of the, the outcrop, for example, and you split them and you split them and, um, you know, to get a set of analyses. And then you add in things like project standards, standards as well. Uh, in our case, also blanks, because you also want to check for contamination through the analysis. So this work comes, this particular diagram comes from the Norwegian, Norwegian Geological Survey um, who have, uh, you know, face similar issues as well. So you take all of those samples and then you randomize them. You know, you're basically doing a blind test with the, uh, um, with the, uh, the analytical laboratory that you're outsourcing it to. So you mix them all up, you, you know, put everything in there. Um, but you know what the num you know, you know what each sample is, you know, which ones are the control samples, you know, which ones are uh, the, the um, standards, for example. But the takeaway there is you can't outsource quality control. Um, and that's a particularly important one because it's like 
we if we buy data from an, an external laboratory, for example, and we publish it and do all of those sort of things, uh, it's our data. And if something's wrong with that data, the user isn't going to go complain to the laboratory where it came from. They're going to go complain to us. So we own it. Is and then there's the question which we've we're we're struggling with, I guess, or not struggling, we're starting to really engage with, uh, is, you know, how do we capture that meta quality metadata? And I know, and I'm very keen on, on being part of the conversations about how perhaps we standardize some of that uh, across various uh, commercial labs and academic labs and government labs as well. So that, uh, you know, that makes capturing that information and passing it on to users that much easier. Um, and there's also a question about how we do this sort of work for um, high cost or analyses that mixing them up doesn't work, where you actually need to know what order the samples came in, for example, um, and or if they're high cost, because you know each one of these geochemistry analyses might be like $30, for example. So you know you, your project may be able to afford to do hundreds of them. But if, for example, each analysis was $3,000, you're not going to be able to do <laughs> that, that same degree of quality control. So, you know, there's also emerging issues there. Um, and finally, when all else fails, I just appeal to that it's good science. <laughs> and I love this quote from um, Terry Pratchett uh, about science not being a body of facts. It's actually a method for making sure uh, we're getting it right and just not believing things that, are, you know, give us comfort. Um, and I think that's very important that a key part of science is that science is, is self-correcting. It checks itself and checks itself again. Um, and I think that's, an, you know, quality is a, a critical part of that. And there's also opportunity in that is when you really hone in on the quality and you really understand the measurements you're making and you're, you can get those uncertainties down and you can compare and contrast meaningfully between samples between different labs and things like that, you start finding that there's gaps in the science. So this is a, a great example from Elisa Bokalik about um, the carbon-14 um, measurements that the, the, the age that you measure of carbon-14 and the actual age that the sample came from is a bit of a gap. And this puzzled people for a very long time, um, but was only made apparent when they really, really honed in on that quality. Uh, it turns out that in large, it's something to do with how, how radiocarbon cycles through the oceans. So that gap is actually telling us something about how climate changes. And so, you know, there's an enormous amount of science in just driving the quality to, to into those gaps and looking into those uh, where things don't quite meet up with what our expectations are. So what are we doing at Geoscience Australia? Um, we're building a laboratory from Geoscience Australia is a big strategy, strategy 2028. Uh, we're part of that. Um, so some of the things, you know, the laboratory contributes to, these are sort of key parts of the Geoscience Australia's laboratory around resources well for water resources, our marine jurisdictions, as I talked about with the, uh, the seafloor samples, um, but also in, in a, enabling an informed Australia that the data that we provide is as good as it can be and it has a long shelf life, that someone can use that data today and come back in 20 years time and it's still useful, it still has meaning. Uh, very conscious of, of things like, you know, the FAIR uh, principles for data management. Um, and I'm sure this group is well aware of those as well. Um, you know, we're also looking at things about uh, how we automate um, some of our systems. And there's, uh, the last 10 years in particular, I've just seen a huge um, swelling of um, new instrumentation, particularly in the sort of microbiology side of things, but they're starting to flow through in other science systems as well about how to miniaturize and automate a lot of the analyses that we do, um, which again has data implications about how do we, you know, capture that fire hydrant of data that's, you know, these machines are capable of producing now. Um, and then ultimately it's also back to people like Joe, you know, what do they want? What do they see as quality uh, in their samples? Uh, and I think that's a, it's a, a quite a critical part of, of that is that, yes, we can get very hung up about, you know, the uncertainty and measuring a standard on the shrimp, for example, but, you know, perhaps the, the user of that information is actually interested in something else about the quality um, and they want to see that in the data set or, or, or in the metadata as well. Um, so we're... Uh, I won't go through all of these, so we're, we're developing a, a strategy for the lab that's, that's looking at a lot of uh, trying to bring all those sort of threads together. Um, 
and I'll sort of quickly run through some of those things. Uh, particularly, we're building a new laboratory um, as we speak. We're just about the we are packing up the, the old laboratory, uh, the new ones being built uh, and all going well. Uh, you know, COVID and supply lines willing, um, it will be finished uh, by mid-May and we'll be moving in, in mid-May. As well as the new physical uh, facility, we've also got the opportunity to update some of the, the network stuff. So as we're talking about those, that automated data management as well, we have the opportunity to upgrade the network. So all of the instruments are plugged in and uh, we have the, the appropriate software sitting on a server that the, the data can automatically flow to. So we can start capturing that. Um, and But again, it's like very interested to find out how we manage that, you know, going forward, how, you know, what parts of that information data are useful for people and how we get it out to them. Uh, it's also a chance to review our workflows and uh, really hone in on how we um, recommit and up our quality management game as well. Um, we've invested in a laboratory information management system uh, about three, four years ago, and uh, have been steadily working on that to implement it across all our workflows and processes and, and bring all of that uh, uh, online um, and also in this particular case of so this this um, uh, Starlin's application is, is uses its all all its capabilities because there's actually there's a lot in the back end that we we still haven't fully utilized yet again for capturing um, a lot of quality information about uh, the laboratory processes and what's happening um, with those samples and those processes. Um, the ultimate aim there is that we want to get uh, NATA accreditation. So NATA is the Australian um, standard authorization body. Uh, we want to get uh, to a point where we can do NATA accreditation for some of our processes. Uh, we've had a look at this over the last few years and in many of our processes, we actually are capturing the data that would be required for accreditation. It's just not usually again in a, in a, a way that's accessible or easy to find or sort of brought together in a central place. So yeah, we've, we, we do have some data management issues there as well to, to work through to, to get to that point. Um, which is, yeah, what I'm saying is, you know, how do we make all that quality information uh, accessible both to ourselves, but also uh, outside as well. Uh, and then I think a very important thread, and again, this is something we're really working with to, um, with, within the laboratory team, but also the broader Geoscience Australia is about that idea that quality, um, quality is actually sort of you know, its own pillar right next to the product. As I said, a lot of, a lot of scientists will, will focus on the product and the data on, on the information, but uh, um, it's no good without that sort of focus on quality as well. Um, so some of you may be familiar with this, you know, these concepts of continuous improvement, whether it's called Lean or Six Sigma or Total Quality Management, but they all sort of have this kind of um, uh, sort of setup, um, particularly around quality and product that obviously, you know, you want the best quality delivered um, and, you know, on time uh, with a reasonable cost and safely, of course, in the laboratory is very important. Um, but yeah, finding the time and space to emphasize that work, work on producing the product is just as important as the quality um, as well. It, um, that, yeah, they, they both need to be uh, well resourced and given the time to, um, to be worked on. And uh, yeah, it's just a, a key part of that is building that culture. Um, so one thing we've been doing, um, and this is a particularly good um, exercise during lockdown as well, when we couldn't get into the laboratory, was going back and looking at our workflows and to try and understand, you know, where, um, where some of the, the, the issues were in the workflow, where some of the inefficiencies were, um, but also thinking about, well, where, where's the where's the value adding that we're doing? You know, where's the quality information that we should be capturing as we go through these processes as well? So I hope that sort of gives you a whirlwind visit to Geoscience Australia Laboratory um, and uh, gives you some idea about our, what we're doing to renew our commitment to quality management and, uh, and, and data issues. Uh, we're very keen to contribute to this community and other, other communities that are involved involved in this work uh, and keen to understand how we can help and, and how our, our developments can align with uh, what what uh, what you are doing as well. Um, I sort of hope those those sort of key takeaway messages that I try and 
um, drum home to our clients um, resonate with you or um, have some meaning for you as well. Um, very keen to hear your thoughts. Um, so at the end of the day, yes, it's about people like Jo um, and, and getting the information uh, that she wants that so she can trust um, our data and make you know valuable decisions based on it, uh, both now, but also who knows, 20 years or beyond in the future. Um, so that's partly why we've been uh, we have that mantra about today's quality is tomorrow's reputation is that we you know we want what we do today will matter you know uh, many years from now as well so so thank you very much um, I'll leave it there and, and happy to take some questions thank you